Good morning and welcome to Ordinary Life. I'm so glad you're here. Is your mic on? Uh, yes, okay. my mic is on. Can you hear me? Barely. Barely. Yeah, it's on. Just yell. So uh, we begin every Sunday now by uh, saying that we have an intention for all of what happens in our life. Wait, we forgot announcements. Oh, and it was our do, job. You do that. Okay, there are two announcements. One is uh, donations for musical instruments for the Boynton After School Music Program, um, Boynton Methodist Church. With the ordinary women, have this collaboration with them, and I think see Barbara. Could I also say see Callista? Could I also say Okay. See any of the ordinary women in this class <laughs> about musical instruments. Um, the second announcement is just thank you for your continued support, both financially, in person, and online. All of the financial donations go to, I think, great causes in Houston, supported and solicited or submitted by class members. Um, instead of passing the plate in person, it's just on the back table. So if you would like to make a um, financial contribution, that's where you do it. And online, you just go to the donate button and follow the prompts. That's it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now you can start. Well, I was just going to say that we want to begin each of, each of the classes that we do with, oop, make that go back, with these three intentions, that we deepen an awareness and understanding of who we are, of who our neighbor is, and of who sacred mystery is, that we live and move and have our being in God. It's a Pauline idea. And for you to know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Okay, so I need to get something out of the way. Since we uh, began announcing that we were going to begin in person and started doing in person, I have had between two and 300 inquiries about whether I was going to do any magic in ordinary life ever again. <laughs> two and 300 inquiries. Yeah, between two. And 300. And 300. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and um, the answer is I've never done magic in ordinary life. Um, I know that some of you think that, but I thought that maybe instead what I might do is teach you a magic trick that you can do at home. You can do it with four cards. I prefer to use the aces, but you can use any four cards from any deck. I prefer to use blue back cards because I believe in color coordination. <laughs> the cards should match my eyes. Okay, they're not blue. They're gray blue. You got some gray blue eyes going on. Actually, to make this um, trick a little bit easier to understand, I'm just going to use three cards, okay? Three cards. This is a three card effect that you can learn and, okay. That did not go well. Okay. Get rid of this card. Three cards. One, two, three cards. And with only three cards, <laughs> this is not going like I had planned. One card, two cards, only three cards, okay? Three cards. <laughs> I'm getting rid of another one. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it, I got it down. You cannot fool me again. One card, two cards, three cards, okay? Just three <laughs> cards. You know what? I'm not gonna be able to do this trick. I'm not gonna teach it to you. For one thing, I can't stay down to the three cards. And for another thing, these cards no longer match my eyes. <laughs> You can't say. <laughs> okay. So the first Sunday that we had in-person um, gathering after the lockdown, I said that in seeking to walk a path of paradox and contradiction, 
You are going to see every Sunday two images, and these are the two images that were up today at the beginning, uh, and they, they're going to continue to be there. One is uh, of an icon, and the other is of a painting. The icon is called the icon of Pantocrator. The word Pantocrator means powerful or mighty. And I have been fortunate enough to travel in Greece and Turkey several times. It was, I, I, I've seen this likeness of the Pantocrator hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, it was not, however, until I read Amos Smith's work, Healing the Divide, Recovering Christianity's Mystic Roots, that I learned the history of this very pervasive icon. It is everywhere in both Eastern and um, Orthodox and Russian Orthodox churches. I Googled the images of the Pantocrator, and this is what came up. I mean, it's everywhere. Mm. It's everywhere in every conceive it's the same icon same painting but dip, done by by different ones this is one of the oldest surviving depictions that we have of Jesus it is not what Jesus looked like it's an icon uh, we'll talk more about icons probably before this is over and one of the reasons that I like icons I've got several uh, around the space uh, in my study because I think this icon can be a doorway toward a deeper experience of non-duality. The icon was found in a monastery in Egypt where the early followers of Jesus who did not get caught up in the movements being co-opted by Rome fled to preserve the teachings of Jesus and to preserve their communal life. The icon dates from around the fifth century and uh, this icon is like looking at both sides of a coin at once. When you look at the icon, you will notice that the two eyes of Jesus are markedly different. His right eye is distinctly human, a delicate smoothness and lucidity. His right eyebrow is normal. His left eyebrow is rough, mysterious, piercing. The eyebrow is unusually arched. So contained within this one artistic depiction is both divinity and humanity. Jesus is quoted as saying, I and the Father are one. When we get to the Gospel of John in a few weeks, we're going to get into all these I am sayings. Whether, whether the, this phrase actually came from the mouth of Jesus, it is clear that in his teachings and his behavior, he was inclusive. His statement was, I have discovered that I am a child of God and so are you. Mm -hmm. Or to paraphrase Jim Finley, I am not God, but I'm not other than God. I'm not you, but I'm not other than you. So over and over, um, you see this. The other image you see every Sunday is that of a painting. This is um, a cutout of Rembrandt's painting called The Return of the Prodigal. And it, too, has a non-dual aspect to it, which Holly's going to talk about later. Um, we'll talk more about this as we get into the story, because we're going to spend um, how long? A couple weeks. A couple three. We had this conversation <laughs> about it. We can't decide. Yeah. So I want, I want to tell you, Smith. We decided we'll see how bored y'all are and how excited we are, and whether that matches up. And we'll go from there. <laughs> so I want to tell you about my, my encounter with this painting. Uh, back in 2012, I was seeing someone for a counseling session, and we had accomplished our, what our agenda was for that session. And having a few minutes of time left, he asked me if Sherry and I had any trips planned, and we did. And I told him that in a few months we were going to Russia. They were going to take a river cruise going from Moscow to St. Petersburg. And he said, are you going to the Hermitage in St. Petersburg? And I said, yes, that is on the itinerary. And he said, wonderful. You'll get to see the original of the painting that's hanging on the wall outside your office. <laughs> now, since I am a teacher of awareness and paying attention, I said, 
what painting? <laughs> and he looked at me stunned, and he said, come on. So I got up, we went outside the door, and there hanging on the wall is a reproduction of Rembrandt's painting of the return of the prodigal son. And so he began to talk to me about, about this painting, and uh, we went back into the office, and after several minutes, he said, surely you have read Andre Nowen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. And I admitted that I had not, and I asked him not to call me Shirley. <laughs> and the next day, there was a package on the table outside my office door, and there was Nowen's book, The Return of the Prodigal Son. Now, I'd read other Nowen's books, we'll talk about Nowen more before today's over. But today, we are going to begin an in-depth look at this parable of Jesus that one biblical scholar says is the best short story ever told. It is the subject of countless movies, short stories, paintings. Um, it's, it's everywhere. So I think that a better title for the parable would be the story of a father's boundless love and acceptance and compassion for his two lost sons. So uh, when Jim Bankston persuaded me to have an office here at the church, we found what was being used as a storage room on the fourth floor and converted it into an office. And um, I'm now no longer there since the renovation. There's a wonderful new office on what I call the grounded floor. <laughs> People who are down there are grounded. And uh, so this that. week, I went up to the fourth floor to see if the painting was still there. It's not. I don't know where, where it is. When we were in St. Petersburg, after seeing the actual painting, which is humongous, it's in one alcove all by itself. Our guide made sure we were there undisturbed for almost as long as we wanted to be. I bought a replica of reproduction of it that's about this big, and it hangs on the second floor of our home right at the top of the stairs. So I get to see it several times a day when I go upstairs. Now, I know that most of you likely think that you know this parable. Mm -hmm. My experience, and your mileage may vary, is that every time I return to one of these stories, I'm shown how far I have yet to go further out and deeper deep in. Each visit stretches me, challenges me. Now, <clears throat> my rereading, I think I'm rereading Nowen's book for the third time, and I'll finish it tomorrow for mm -hmm. the third time. I'm no longer where I was when I first read that. And uh, in dealing with this parable this time around, we're going to have an excellent opportunity to put into practice what we learned from Michael Moorwood about doing theology in the new cosmology, in the, what's called the new cosmology. Michael Moorwood's question to us was, what are you asking me to imagine when you tell me this story? What are you asking me to imagine when you cite this belief or ask me to pray? So that's the challenge we have. It's clear that Nowen wrote this book from a standpoint of cosmological dualism and individual salvation, which we can no longer support. But we can find a meaning, a deeper meaning into this parable. So we've got some exciting territory um, ahead of us. One more thing I'd like to say, and that is that trying to interpret a parable is like trying to explain, explain a joke. Or a magic trick. Or I'm sorry, a, uh, a minor miracle. <laughs> the explanation of a joke isn't funny. So the parables of Jesus are like wild horses. They cannot be controlled, which is one of the marks of what Jesus referred to as the realm of God. It is not under our control. So today we're going to look at the entire parable, and then we're going to come back and for at least three Sundays, do isolated aspects. Bouncing off of Nowen's book, which I do recommend that you read, and bouncing off the, the, the painting, um, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. I love the comparison of a parable to wild horses. There's um, an island that's part of Puerto Rico, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's, no, it's, it's known for its wild horses. 
and when I was there, you literally see these bands of wild horses just come crashing through the, the underbrush, and, and all you can do is stand aside. They're so free. They're so wild. They cannot be tamed, but they're beautiful. They're really just something to behold, and they're not catchable. So one of the things I've been thinking about is kind of offering an experience of both the parable and this piece of art. And offering also the same caveat that I have said before, that as soon as we put words to something, it exists in the realm of dualism. And so to interpret it is almost like asking you to just digest it and then have a different experience. So the words come out, you digest them, have a different experience. <laughs> but somewhere in between, we're obviously going to get into the dualistic territory because we have to put words to something. But it's occurred to me as I've read through The Prodigal Son, looked at a lot of artwork about it. I, I, I am an artist, and as an art major in undergrad, you have to take a lot of art history. So we did a lot of explicating of poem, uh, poems, of artworks. And it's been interesting going and reading some of the explication of this painting. And there's many ways to interpret the parable as there are to interpret artworks. You know, there's just so many ways to see something. There's the situation, there's the story, and then there's the story about the situation, right? And, and how each of us experiences that story is going to also be different. In the latter, in the situation, I think Bill and I and all of us will inevitably project our story onto the situation and make it our own. So over the course of talking about it, we'll do, I think, some active imagination and encourage you to read the parable on your own and just sit with it and imagine who you are, who you are that is there, who you are that isn't there, and look at the art about it and imagine yourself in both of these things. Who are you right now? Who have you been? And who do you want to be in the story? When we look at this parable and painting kind of in two ways, it's almost like interpreting a dream. So, and of course, union analysis, and since I'm the union analyst here, right? <laughs> um, in a dream, we look at all aspects of the dream as if it represents the self. And we can also look at this parable and painting as if we're watching a play and take each character for itself, each as an individual. So there's kind of two ways and probably more that we can engage with it. So at different points in our life, I think each of us might have related to the prodigal son, the older brother, or the father. And also there's these shadowy figures in the background that we can't quite see. In the play, each of the characters plays a separate role with a unique characteristic in each with their own identity. Someone might have played the role of the father for you at some point, or you might have played the role of the father to someone else. And Bill and I were just talking this week about experiencing our sort of judgy, resentful selves and feeling like the older brother, who's like, why are you taking him back into your arms? Undoubtedly, I think there's an element in this parable about coming home to the self, embracing our mistakes, our mishaps, and our pain as part of the complete picture of the self or of a life. This is true in our growth and development as an individual. So in some ways, I'm looking at this painting or parable as the spiritual development of an individual life. And in other ways, different individuals. We grow in our development within our community, within our culture, and within our religion. If we only look at the good parts of each of those, then we miss opportunities for deepening awareness. If we only look at the bad parts, then we miss opportunities for gratitude and celebration. In any situation, I believe we get the most out of it when we look at the whole picture. So on that note, the themes that I hope to expand upon over the next few weeks are who is Number one, who is left out of the narrative of the prodigal son? I think it exists to teach us an important lesson, but there's a lot of unsaid about the, sub, the unsaid subtext also. The story can also, as I said, represent a developmental lifespan, and at every new developmental stage, we transcend and include the one previous. It's important for our children to individuate from us. It's important for us as adults to individuate from our family of origin. And it's also painful. And each of us is our little self, our now self, and our future self. I'll 
tell a little story that you gave to me once. Um, Bill once told me, take a picture of yourself as a little girl. Roddy said this too. Oh, you once said, do it with Josh. Take a picture of Josh with, as a little boy and just carry it with you. Remember that that little boy is in Josh. And I do have a picture of each of us on my board behind my computer of, as little kids. And I look at those pictures almost every day. And so it's just being mindful of that little girl still lives in me. And sometimes when I'm able to just kind of go, when I'm stuck in a moment, I also say to my older self, who I'm not just yet, I'm not 83 yet, but I say sometimes to my 83-year-old self, what should I do? And, and I think sometimes what I hear, hear back is, you're going to be okay. You know, so there's this kind of relationship. That old lady <laughs> is in me too. All of these parts of me are there. So, what? It's not true. I'm, no, 83 is so young. I'm talking about being 183. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, we're, <laughs> if we're lucky and we're diligent in our seeking, I think we do experience mercy, redemption, and unconditional love with others and also from ourselves. It's a story about growing up, about becoming an adult, having an adult faith. So the third thing I want to illustrate is how I see this story as a snapshot of a moment in time, as well as an invitation to sort of make different choices, to make choices about a life. The spiritual journey or life's journey is about our experiences impacting our sense of self as well as our relationships with others. And the, snap, the snapshot here is a single moment. It's the return home, literally, but it's also the return home to the self, symbolically. And there's an invitation for restoration and repair. The actual choice then, this is just the beginning of the story. The parable is just the beginning of the story. On the whole, our hope is to see this parable in the context of evolutionary, psych uh, not evolutionary psychology, but that works too, <laughs> evolutionary cosmology, as well as in the context of Jesus' teachings and how they apply today. How do we use this story today, given all that we know that wasn't known 2,000 years ago? We're trying, and this is challenge, be challenging because the language we use evokes particular images to expand this picture of God beyond the personal God, and beyond the out there God, as well as expand the picture of Jesus beyond a personal savior. We're trying to imagine how these teachings enlarge our beings, as well as our ability to be in relationship to others. There's a theory called string field theory. I am not a string field theorist. I am not Einstein. <laughs> However, string field theory is a continuation of Einstein's work founded by a guy named Michio Kaku. He's Japanese. And he says he, found, he sort of emerged into this theory by a lifelong love of an inquiry with the impossible. In paraphrasing Einstein, he says, if a theory cannot be explained to a child, then the theory is probably worthless. The great ideas are pictorial, explained in the language of pictures. So there's probably hundreds of thousands of, of painted images of the prodigal son. A lot of different artists have done their version of the prodigal son. Rembrandt is one of the best known. A Spanish artist by the name of Murillo is also one of the best known because he paints the whole narrative. I'll show that at some point. But back to string field, string field theory. It's based on a principle that everything in the universe interacts with every other thing in the universe. So it's about connection how we are connected to everything and everyone else. So applying this to the parable, not just the situation of the parable, but the whole story, the homecoming up to the self, unconditional love, embracing that love, and then looking at the ripple effects of all the presumed circumstances of the parable. And then within the parable, let's notice that triad of the father, the son, the older son, and the younger son. These three are bound together. Whether they severed that connection or not, and they each tried, they're still bound. So even when we don't think we're connected to something, we can be connected in the dark or in the light. And so this picture, this parable, is about battling with both, finding that tension. 
uh, the younger son physically leaves and severs the connection with the father, and the older son leaves by burying himself in his resentment and his anger and jealousy. But the fact is, this connection again remains. So the parable is a framework that represents different aspects of the self. Sometimes we're the father with open arms, welcoming the son home. Sometimes we're kneeling down, begging for mercy. And other times, I wonder if we're kind of skeptical of that mercy, looking on like, why does he deserve this? Why don't I? Mercy comes from the French merci. Most of us know that word. And it means several different things. Reward, gift, kindness, grace, and pity. So all of these are present in the parable of the prodigal son. So um, this is not in my notes, but <clears throat> if you will come to the noon communion service or its live stream this week at Wednesday at noon, um, I'll tell you an experience I had while working on today's talk in preparing for the homily for that service. The story that I'm going to focus on on Wednesday is probably one of the best dramatic stories in all the Bible, maybe in all literature. It's the story of the prophet Nathan confronting David. Remember that story? Where Nathan says, thou art the man. And, and uh, there is no, at, at this part in the, the Nathan cycle, I mean the David cycle of stories which we're going through in our lectionary, there is no way, there is no way to see David as a good man. Hmm. He is a scoundrel. He's no better than a Bob Moss, a mob. Mob, mob boss. Trying to, he, or Bob's He boss. has somebody killed. <laughs> yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, my mm -hmm. thinking while working on this homily was, well, at least I'm not as bad as that. <laughs> oh, my God, the elder brother was just right there. Yeah. So... Don't tune out. <laughs> this is the only time we're going to do it this way. But here's the parable. On another occasion, he told this parable. And you know there's a cycle of three stories. There's the lost sheep, one of a hundred. There's the lost coin, one of ten. There's the lost son, one of two. And Jesus is telling these parables because he has been criticized for hanging out with sinners. That's the context. So on another occasion, he told this parable. Once there was a fellow who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. So the father divided the estate between the two boys. Not long after that, the younger son gathered his belongings together and departed for a distant country, where he squandered his inheritance by living extravagantly. Just as he began to run out of funds, a severe famine swept through the land, and he had to do without. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him out to his farm to feed the pigs. He was reduced to satisfying his hunger with eating pig's food because no one gave him anything to eat. He finally came to his senses and said to himself, Lots of my father's hired hands have plenty to eat while I'm dying of starvation. I'll return to my father and I'll tell him, Father, I have sinned against God and I have wronged you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And he acted on his resolve and returned to his father. His father saw him coming while he was still some distance off and his heart went out to his son. He went running out to meet him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against God and I have wronged you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Treat me like one of your, your hired hands. His father commanded his slaves, quick, get our finest robe and put it on him. Provide him with a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. Fetch the fat calf and slaughter it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. After all, the son of mine was dead, but has come back to life. He was lost, but now has been found. And they started to celebrate. 
Now, the older son was out in the field at the time, but as he got closer to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servant boys over and asked him what was going on. The boy told him, your brother's come home and your father slaughtered the fat calf because he's come back safe and sound. The older son was angry and refused to enter the house. So his father came out and began to plead with him. But he said to his father, see here, all these years I have slaved for you. I never once disobeyed your orders. Yet you have never once provided me with so much as a kid goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours shows up, the one who squandered your fortune with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fat cat. To his son the father replied, My child, you are always at my side. Everything that's mine is yours. But we just had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now has been found. Mm. That's the story. You know, one of the things that I learned from reading um, Andre Nowen is that leaving the father at this time would have been like saying, you are dead to me. And we'll get into that. But <laughs> So the father was dead and came back to life yeah. too. So the story is in part about shame and redemption. But it's not in the way that I imagine most of us were taught. The traditional interpretation is God's redemptive, salvific love for his creatures reinforces that three-tiered universe in which humans are inherently flawed, but we are saved by God's grace. The interpretation we are working with is about the kind of redemption experienced when we come home again to the true self. I want to distinguish between shame and guilt. Guilt is beneficial regret. It's when we're aware we've done something wrong and we are attempting to make it better by saying, I'm sorry, I've done something wrong, please forgive me. And we can move on from guilt. Shame, however, results from untransformed guilt. When we get buried in it or we have an overall feeling of unworthiness and internalized and even inherited shame. There's research being done on the inheritance of generations before us, shame, can destroy us. And this parable represents the beginning of a healing journey that transforms shame into growth. And the healing is working through all of the characters in the parable. I feel like so many of us raised in the Christian tradition can recall this story almost reflexively. Once there was a fellow who had two sons, and we can kind of tune out and go, oh, I know this one, right? <laughs> um, what can we possibly offer that's new? We won't offer everything new, that's for sure. Some of it is reinforcement of what is truer than true. This parable has become like an archetype. And the fact is that love can transform everything, full stop. You're going to hear us say that. That's one of the be best messages of this parable. And if that's all you get over the next couple weeks, that's fine. That's enough. Just remember that love can transform everything. And we hope we offer a little bit more. I once, when I was, gosh, probably 18 or 20, 1994, um, I heard the song The Prodigal Daughter by a folk singer named Michelle Schacht. And when I heard it for the first time, it dropped on me kind of like a ton of bricks. I thought, holy something. She is who has been missing from this story, the prodigal daughter. She's whose absence I felt without really knowing that I felt it. This idea, so it didn't originate with me, but that it sort of settled into me. And I want to open some thought pathways for us about who isn't in the story of the prodigal son, but who is implied in what he does, his debauchery, his shenanigans, and his kind of going off into the wild. And thus, who set the stage for his redemption and restoration? So there's the story, and there's the story beneath the story. When we imagine the father's loving hands upon the son's shoulders, I think let's not forget the circumstances that brought him there. So much of the feminine has been edited out of the Bible, but their presence is felt in the story beneath the story. These two paintings, the one on my right, your left, is by Rembrandt as well. The pic and the one on the, my left, your right, is by Murillo. It's one of the scenes of the prodigal sons. These are ideas of what he got up to in his absence. 
And actually Rembrandt painted that painting on, uh, on my right when he was quite young. When he was, he, it is said that Rembrandt was just this very arrogant, kind of living large kind of guy. And um, this is a self-portrait of him with a woman. So the, even though these are some of the ideas about what he got up to, you know, cavorting with different women, who knows how many children he had, but might not know about it. <laughs> but they are not mentioned in the story. And I wonder, are the prodigal daughters receiving the same grace? I want to read some of the lyrics to the song that I just mentioned and experience the contrast with which she, even today, might still be treated. So the song goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> What is to be done with a prodigal son? Welcome him home with open arms. Throw a big party, invite your friends, our boys come back home. When a girl goes home with the oats he's sown, it's draw your shades and your shutters. She's bringing such shame to the family name, the return of the prodigal daughter. Went to see a doctor and I almost died when I told my mama, Lord, how she cried. Look, here comes a prodigal son. Fetch him a tall drink of water. But there's none in the cup, because he drank it all up, left for a prodigal daughter. So my question is, how would she be received with the oats he's sown? And with, with shades drawn, or would we receive her too with open arms? Whenever we hear a story, I think we have to consider who's doing the telling, who's doing the hearing, and who's passing it along. Pieces are edited out and changed with each telling. Or stories are told to suit a particular audience. This story may have been told probably to a group of men. And this, as I said before, is a snapshot, a single moment in time that we are witness to, that we're witness to the father's unconditional love of the, of the son's return. But unconditional love is not without boundaries. It is not just a like, whatever you need, baby. Unconditional love is, part, is accountable. We hold people accountable when we love them. I think this, too, is part of the story. And the story of the prodigal son, certainly, I'm a mother of three sons. <laughs> it elicits in me a well of compassion for the son and awe for the father. And as, as a mother, there's nothing I can't imagine doing for my kids to ensure their well-being. I think many of us, you know, we've seen pictures of, like, mothers lifting up cars to save their children. <laughs> we can imagine doing that. And most of us know that we also have to let them go and even fall, sometimes really hard. Not so that we have the opportunity to save them, but so that they want it badly enough for themselves. And that is so hard to do. And the conditions for the return to the true self always require a fall away from it. So yes, we ought to celebrate the story and the sun and all that it teaches us about mercy and redemption and unconditional love, but I also want to make space for the prodigal daughter, for who she is in the story. I read a fun fact about Rembrandt's painting, a little side note. If you look at the hands of the father in this painting, this is an up close of it, they're quite different. It's like the Pantocrator. His right hand has a lighter color than the left, the fingers on the right are longer and thinner than those on the left hand. The right hand seems to be more feminine, the left more masculine and blocky, kind of like the icon. And the reason for these differences has been debated quite a bit over the years, and one of the primary explanations is that this father represents the mother and the father, an and androgynous being who welcomes the son home, kind of like how I imagine a god would be not a sex, not a person, not a being, but an amalgamation of all. So this father who represents divine mystery as well as the whole integrated self is both mother and father. I used to work at a school, this gets a little bit back to the prodigal daughter, and I've worked at several schools over the years, but like many high schools across America, there were often, or not often, but occasionally probably one to three a year teenage pregnancies. And where I worked, um, most girls would choose to have the babies, and they would raise the babies with the help of mothers and grandmothers. But the school had a policy that as soon as the girl started to show, she had to leave. And she had to continue her education elsewhere. Nothing was ever done to the boy. Okay? And he got to stay in the community. He was, he was welcomed. 
I never thought that was fair. It never sat right with me. So we can't heal as a person. We can't heal a community. We can't heal ourselves if we deny aspects of the story, if we deny the prodigal daughter. I tell you this to highlight how girls and women in our culture are often treated differently in the same circumstances. And like I mentioned last week, many of us have been taught that to overvalue a young woman's pearl or purity over a young man's, so much so that we made mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, a virgin. We're more ready to accept that than we are to accept that she had sex. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but <laughs> this is, so what we're actually doing is having a birds and the bees talk, guys, okay? We're just going to tell you how it's done. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Let's use this story to frame a question. Who are we excluding? As the father, do we extend our unconditional love to all? What Meister Eckhart calls wireless love. As the son, are we mindful of those we might have hurt along the way or betrayed? As the elder son, can we let go of scorn, judgment, resentment, anger, and grow our capacity for love and forgiveness? Surely I am called to integrate all of these aspects of myself, to recognize that there are moments when I've been each of them. I don't yet know if I'm fully the father working on it. And the invitation, too, to welcome the prodigal sons and daughters into our fold without judgment and shame, but just be a container where people can be held in love. It's not because they shouldn't repair or take responsibility or you know, do accounting for but that we can make space for it to be done in a safe way. And with us, with with anyone that we encounter, I want to imagine creating a community that's committed to healing and committed to loving our whole selves into being. This is the passage from Eckhart's Book of Secrets about why-less love. It says, love knows no why. For if I love someone because of what it brings me, I end up loving only myself. But when I love another for the goodness that is in them, I begin to love without a why. So devote yourself to this why-less love and seek the goodness that is there in each and all, a light that ever burns, however dimly, even in the darkest soul. So there is, uh, in Centering Prayer, the practice of taking a word or phrase and focusing on it Mm -hmm. in meditation. And there is a practice uh, called Lectio Divina, Mm -hmm. where you can take parts of the story and work on it, read it. Uh, And there's Visio Divina, and that's why I show the icon and the painting every Sunday. Because I I think that they can speak to us in ways that words can't, and they can communicate something that Holly and I can't, can't get across. It's... It's non-communicable. Non-duality communicates itself, but we have to be open to that experience. So we're going to follow somewhat um, Henri Nouwen's treatment of this parable and painting. And we talked at length yesterday about how we're going to proceed. I think that what we're going to do is take Each of the main characters to start with, the the younger son, the elder brother, the father. But if you look carefully at the painting, there are other people in the painting. Who are they? Now, we have to make that up. I mean, art history may be able to tell us some things about it. But if you look really carefully at the painting, you'll see that there's a cherub playing a flute. And I don't think, Rimet didn't put anything in the painting accidentally. No, he was so deliberate about everything he did. And, and it, very self-revealing. Is he in the painting? That supposedly he's the father. But probably he's all three. Certainly he had all three in, in his life. Mm-hmm. Um, I first, I, though I had not read Henri Nouwen's book uh, when my client re- gave it to me, I had read um, a book of his called The Wounded Healer. Many of you have likely read that too. It came out probably in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, interestingly, Henri Nouwen was born in the Netherlands just like Rembrandt. 
And they have a lot of life parallels in terms of family of origin and that sort of thing. We'll probably talk more about Nawan uh, next week. He was an exceptionally accomplished, bright individual. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He became a clinical psychologist. He taught at Harvard for like 10 years. He taught at Yale. And he spent the last years of his life uh, living and working in the large community devoted to mentally handicapped people. He was, before then, very active in the civil rights movement in this country. He was very active in the peace movement. And you can go online and read more about him and his accomplishments. He died in 1966. And he died just three days before one of my best friends, who is also a psychologist and a Methodist minister, was scheduled to go to Toronto and spend an extended period of time with uh, Nowen in, in Toronto. Now, I think most of us have come to understand this story as one about a son's gone wrongness, a father's forgiveness, and the elder brother's snit. <laughs> I'm nothing like the older brother. And so we have come basically to see it as a story of repentance and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. If, however, you keep in mind that this story was told by a Jew to a Jewish audience, this story was provocative enough to make the people who heard it want to kill Jesus. We have to do whatever is required to hear the story with that kind of radical impact. It's not a sweet story about come to Jesus and everything is going to be okay. The theology in this parable is as radical as it can be. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> the reason people heard this story is offensive is because the rule of God, the community of empowerment Jesus talked about and demonstrated, was not something that decides between or divides. It's something that includes and unites. And Jesus is clearly rejecting the notion that some group is going to be rejected at the expense of another. And yet, that has come to be what much religion is all about. Mm -hmm. And although we are going to talk about the characters in the story and some that aren't, um, our desire is likely primary, primarily to identify with the younger brother. The fact is, at least this is true for me, mm -hmm. we are most likely the elder son. I mean, let's just face it. If everybody drove like me and used their turn signals. Do you know, I, now I think of you every dang time I use a turn signal. Thanks for that. Good. Doing this for Bill. <laughs> well, there'd be no accidents, right? Uh -huh. Or, you know, you got your pet phrase. If everybody just then. Mm -hmm. So here is my hope for the next few weeks. Uh, and, and we did the pearl of great, the treasure in a field, the pearl of great price, and this story, why? As preliminary work to lay the groundwork for an extended deep dive into the Gospel of John. Okay? That's where we're going. Hmm. So um, my hope for these next few weeks is that we experience and express those intentions that we begin every time with that we deepen our understanding of who we are. Um, I think that self-rejection is probably the chief hindrance to a spiritual life. That we deepen our understanding of sacred mystery and that we deepen our understanding of others. So if you have known or are knowing in your life loneliness, dejection, or jealousy, anger, you will find as we work to inhabit the story, healing. That's why we call this time today returning home again for the first time. So I have two suggestions for you. Uh, first, I want you to notice 
which one of these figures in the story you have the most difficulty identifying with. Mm -hmm. That's likely where your spiritual work lies. And second, take this story home with you. Put it in your head. Put it in your heart. Let it speak to you. Read it over every day for a while. Get a reproduction of the painting and put it where you can see it. Let the story speak to you. Just read it and be with it. Don't think you know it already. If you let the story speak to you, I believe that it can take you home. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and we'll see you here next week. Thank you. Thank you.